Hello, everyone. You're listening to Unlocking Greatness Podcast with Zenja Glass. I have tried at least on three or four occasions to get this lesson out, uh, once or twice uploading it, and um, the upload was not successful, and uh, once or twice just doing a recording. So this lesson must be extremely important uh, because I feel like the enemy is fighting very hard to keep me from giving it. I want to talk about the importance of... um, Seeking Wisdom and Advice from God. I don't even know what title I'm going to give this, but this is all about being aware of um, uh, bad advice and lies that can be told to you. And if you're not careful to seek uh, wisdom from God, it can lead you astray. So I want to talk a little bit about what happened to Rehoboam and Jeroboam um, from the book of First Kings. Um, and I'm just going to you know, not, not add any fluff to this whatsoever. I just want to get directly to the point. I've actually got to get out of here for work, but I wanted to make sure I talked about this. In first Kings, um, chapter 11, let's start with Solomon. Uh, Solomon, um, was King David's son. So let's start there. And Solomon, uh, stopped, um, really obeying what God told him to do. If you, if you look in, um, uh, first Kings chapter 11, you can start somewhere in about verse three or so. And it talks about how he had 700 wives, <laughs> 700 wives of royal birth and 300 um, co- uh, concubines. And it says, and his wives led him astray. Now I'm in First Kings chapter 11, verse 4. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David's father had been. As the heart of David his father had been, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians. Uh, and Molech, the detestable God of the Ammonites. And then it goes on down in verse 7. It says, um, Solomon built a high place for Shemek, um, the detestable God of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable God of the Ammonites. So Solomon just basically went left field. And because he was so in love with all of these women and all of their gods that they bought to him, um, he allowed all of these gods to be built and uh, began to worship them, which is, you know, really unfortunate. In verse 9, it says, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you've not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I've commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. And uh, he goes on down to say in verse 12 and 13, you can read that part on your own, uh, basically just says, I'm not going to take it away in your lifetime because he allowed Solomon to reign for about 40 years or so. He says, but I'm going to do this with your with your son. So now let's just um, um, drop on down a little bit more uh, to when this happened. So Solomon had a son named uh, Rehoboam. I believe that was his name. And um, Solomon had an official. This was not his child, but one of his officials. Um, called Jeroboam. So just think of an R and think of a J, and we're going to get into this. So Jeroboam, um, if you look in verse 26, um, it says he was one of Solomon's officials. And if you look in verse 28, it just says Solomon put him in charge of his whole labor force. Okay. Um, So he's a pretty sharp man. Uh, Then if you go on down to verse 29 or 30, and again, I'm just skimming through this because I'm trying to get through about three or so chapters, um, or at least two or so chapters very quickly. I just want to get to the point of the story, but I'm just trying to give you a backdrop. So if you look down in verse, um, um, you know, 29 and 30, there's a prophet named Ahijah. And this prophet basically came to um, Jeroboam and said, hey, uh, I'm going to, God is going to raise you up to... um, um, rule over uh, Israel. I'm going to give you, uh, let me just read it because I have a hard time paraphrasing, but basically he just said, I'm going to give you 10 tribes and I'm going to give Rehoboam only one. So you're going to get 10, which is more so the northern part of Israel. And I'm only going to leave one tribe to Rehoboam from the house of David, because I'm going to still honor my promise, even though they ain't doing what they need to do, but I'm going to leave one, but I'm going to tear everything else away because they're not following and doing what I told them to do. That's the the shortest version, but let me add some scriptures behind it so my biblical scholars um, don't say, hey, Z, don't paraphrase too much, just read it. So um, in 1 Kings 11, verse 31, uh, this is what this prophet said to him. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself. He had ripped basically his cloak or something he was wearing. And he said, take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. 
and give you ten tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I've chosen out of all of my tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this. I'm in verse 33 now. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worship Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidians, Shemach, the god of Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in my ways, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my statues and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I would not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. Um, I've made him ruler um, all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David. Uh, then it just goes on to say in verse 35, I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and will give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me. So you get the point. I'm just kind of giving some some backup to what I just said because I know I did a, a little bit of paraphrasing. So um, now if you drop down a little bit more, uh, let me see where I want to pick it up from here. Um, verse 42 talks about Solomon reigned in Jerusalem for about 40 years. Then he ended up resting with his fathers. Okay, fine. So chapter 12 is when we get into Rehoboam. So Rehoboam, keep in mind, this is Solomon's son. Rehoboam, this is where the point of this, this podcast really comes in at. You would think that if you're, uh, if, you, if you're looking at your father, Solomon, you're looking at your, what would that be, his grandfather, David, um, you look at what was done, you would think you'd be walking in a little bit of wisdom and you'd be wise with how you're going to go about ruling over God's people. So here you go with Rehoboam. Rehoboam, basically, I'm going to give you my paraphrased version first and then to, to make sure the biblical scholars who follow my podcast know that, that what I'm saying is correct, I'll then read some scriptures. Um, but the bottom line is that Rehoboam did not follow advice. He actually ran to some of his friends and took their advice. He did not want to follow any advice from the elders uh, and basically treat people well. Instead, he was like, I'm running things now. I'm going to treat people even harsher. So um, that's the shortest version I can give you. God was not pleased with that and allowed Jeroboam, who was his dad's official. So just keep that in mind. He's like, I'm just going to raise somebody else up to take over 10 tribes and you only going to end up with one. That's the shortest version. So now let me just read through that just a little bit in first Kings 12. And I'm going somewhere with this um, because this story has not been able to get off my heart for well over a week now, probably closer to two weeks. And that's why it's important. I'm talking about it. And if this recording is longer than you want it to be, because right now I'm at seven minutes, don't worry about it. Just stop it and come back to it later when you can. Cause, um, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, stop and chop this up. Um, as many of you are aware, I'm extremely busy this week. Uh, my book launches this week, by the way. So you all are going to be getting that information. And, and when I tell you it's quite a bit of work, you just have no idea all that goes behind it. So anyway, I've got to get to the office, but in first Kings chapter 12, uh, Rehoboam, let me see how, where I want to pick up in here. Uh, basically, the people went to Rehoboam and said, hey, your father put a heavy yoke on us, lighten our labor. That's in verse 4. Uh, then in verse uh, 6, again, I'm in 1 Kings chapter 12. Um, King Rehoboam um, consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? The people, people were basically like, we tired. Can you lighten the load for us? And, um, and the elders basically gave him the advice. They said, hey, if you give them a favorable answer, they're going to always be your servant. So you can read verse 7 to find out about that. Verse 8, check this out. But Rehoboam rejected the advice that the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the, the yoke your father put on us? Uh, and then you can read all the way through that. But basically, his friend said, um, absolutely not. You tell them we're going to make it even harder. So you can read verse 10 all the way through, um, you know, verse maybe 13 or so. And uh, he turned around and took his um, friend's advice instead of taking the elder's advice and basically brought everybody back together. And uh, in verse 13, it says, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men. And um, he basically said, my father made your yoke heavy. I'll make it even heavier. And he basically just went on to tell him, basically, it's going to be even harder. You're going to do what I say to do. So uh, the Lord wasn't pleased with that. And uh, the Lord basically said, hey, I'm going to get somebody else and raise somebody else up since you won't follow my advice and you're doing all this, all of this craziness. Now, I'm going to jump down a little bit more. Let me see where I want to go here. Um, so Jeroboam, keep in mind, uh, at some point, Solomon even tried to kill him because, you know, I think Solomon must have known this guy's going to take over one day. So now that Solomon's dead 
and his son is acting a fool, not following advice and treating people even harshly, Jeroboam comes back on the scene. And people basically say, we want to make you king. So if you if you jump down to verse 20, I apologize if I'm, go- if I'm going a little quickly. Let me just slow down. In verse 20 of First Kings 12, uh, when all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, you know, because Jeroboam had ran off to Egypt for a minute because Solomon was trying to kill him. But now, again, Solomon's dead. So Jeroboam's like, let me get my butt on back over there and See what I can do. Um, So in verse 20, when all the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over Israel. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. So uh, Rehoboam was about to go to war against him. But if you read, you know, through the next few verses, you'll see that, um, you know, God basically told him in verse 24, do not go up and fight against your brothers, the Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this is my doing. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The Lord said, this is my doing. So they obeyed the word of the Lord and went home again as the Lord had ordered. So the Lord, the Lord basically told Rehoboam and his and his troops, I think it was about 180,000 of them or so, uh, give or take. He said, um, no, 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 you're not going to go up to war against them. I'm the one that tore this kingdom away from you because I put you in this position and you got up here and act like you don't you don't you don't even know me anymore. You're allowing all this worship of all these other gods and this and that. And by the way, if you get some time to study out these gods, you'll see this was not just some little thing. These are golden calves and things. These are um, um, gods of uh, what do they call it? But all these people were sacrificing their children to these guys. They believed in the afterlife and they believed that they sacrificed their kids that it did something. So this was not not on a small level of any kind like walking around with just a little charm in your hand. They went completely left field and forgot all that the Lord had done when he when he pulled them out of Egypt. So God was greatly, um, I don't know if I should use the word hurt or offended or appalled, but let's just say it didn't sit well with the Lord. So now you get down to Jeroboam. Now again, Jeroboam's not Solomon's son. Bible scholars, you can correct me if I'm wrong. He's one of Solomon's officials, but now he's basically running 10 of the tribes, right? So you would think, okay, Jeroboam's going to act right, because after all, some prophet told him, hey, the Lord has, is going to put you over everything. Well, he didn't either. So let's get into Jeroboam. I'm in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. Jeroboam, um, let me see here. And verse 25 through 31, again, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but the bottom line is Jeroboam was a very political person. He knew that, let me, let me read verse 26. Um, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom would now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, which is what they all did, just so you know, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. So instead of them doing their traditional, you know, uh, prayers and sacrifices and things that they did to the Lord, Jeroboam came up with his his own idea that, you know what, I'm going to make some gods for them myself so they don't have to do all that traveling and they don't have to a couple times a year be going up there looking at Rehoboam, my enemy. I want to keep them down here with me. So verse 28, after seeking advice, now we're talking about Jeroboam, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people, the people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people even though they were not the Levites. I won't even get into that, but if you know anything about how priests were appointed, they were always from the tribe of the Levites. At least that was what the Lord said. But Jeroboam's like, eh, I'm going to appoint my own priest. I'm going to do my own thing. So you can go on and read all about what he did. He did a whole lot of stuff. Um, He offered sacrifices on the altar. Um, 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 I'm in verse, I think, 32. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places he had made. I'm in verse 33 now. On the 15th day of the eighth month, uh, the month of his own choosing. So again, not consulting God on nothing. Like, I'm just going to make this my, our, our day of festivals. So in the month of his own choosing, he offered sacrifices on the altar he had built to uh, Bethel. So now let me drop down now to uh, 1 Kings chapter 13, which is what my short little clip was about the other day. Um, 
when I put up a, um, I think it was a, a YouTube reel. It was just a short clip about uh, uh, some man that wasn't following advice, uh, that didn't seek the Lord. Well, now this is where this comes in. So First Kings chapter 13 says that, um, let me paraphrase first. Basically, there was a man that God sent to tell Jeroboam, you messed up. Um, I'm about to tear all of this down. Uh, I'm going to send a son named Josiah who's from the house of David. And um, all of y'all basically are going to die <laughs> because how dare you do all of these things and, and, and build these gods and stuff to me. And the same man of God that went to warn him, God told that same man of God, don't you go back the way you came. Don't eat nothing from them. Don't do nothing. I just want you to give my message and bring your butt on back home. I'm totally paraphrasing. And that's what the man was setting out to do. But my God, on his way back, somebody else rode after him and said, hey, come on back. And, and lied to the man and told him, um, the Lord said, you can, you can eat with me. Come on back and eat. And the man turned around and went back and ended up causing him his life. That's the short version. Now, let me kind of um, go into a few scriptures with this. First Kings chapter 13, by the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering. He cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord. O altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who now make offerings here, and human bones will be bear, burned on you. And he goes on to give him a very bad prophecy about what's to happen. You know, of course, Jeroboam got mad. And if you go down to verse, um, um, uh, I don't know, 6, um, you know, Jeroboam was like, sees him, you know, like pointed his hand at this man and, 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 and this man of God. Let me just read it. Verse six. Then the king said to the um, man of God, intercede with the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored. Um, let me go up a little bit more. And verse four, when King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, seize him. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about how the altar was split apart. He basically asked the man, can you heal my hand? The man prayed for him. His hand was healed. He was able to pull it back. Um, now, let me get into this. Uh, in verse 7, the king said to the man of God, come home with me and have something to eat. Now, here's the, the meat of the story, which I'm 17 minutes in just to get to this point. The king said to the man of God, come home with me and have something to eat, and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, even if you were to give me half of your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. So, so far, so good. This man of God appears out of nowhere. Um, well, he came from Judah. But, you know, warns um, Jeroboam and tell him, hey, you ain't doing right. All this is about to be taken away. Let me get my butt on back like God told me. So far, so good. Then you go on down to verse 11. Uh, let me paraphrase first. There's basically a man who's, who, who said, who is this person? Let me go after him and get him. Uh, and he got on a donkey and went after the man. So in verse 11, uh, let me just jump down a little bit. Um, there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done uh, that day. They also told their father what he said to the king. Their father asked, which way did he go? And his son showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. And when they saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man. Now, don't forget verse 14, and rode after the man, because I'm going to come back to that. He found him sitting under an oak tree. And now let me jump down a little bit. Um, he said, are you uh, the man of God who came from Judah? The guy says, I am. So the prophet said to him, come home with me and eat. Now check this out in verse 16. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. Verse 17, I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. So imagine you remember what God told you, right? You're doing your best to follow and do what, he, what he's telling you to do. But somebody else, a lying spirit is what it is, is approaching you to try to get you to do something else. And instead of going back and consulting the Lord and saying, God, I know you're not a liar. You told me to do this. But now somebody else is telling me that you told them to tell me to do something different. And there was no consulting of the Lord. So watch what happens. 
And we go back to verse 16 again. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water um, with you in this place. I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. Verse 18, the old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. While they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. My God. Mm, mm, mm. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your father's. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown down on the road, both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Now, I'm going to pause there for a second. I'm going to comment on something, and then I'm going to get out. So, the bottom line is that this man was trying to do what was right. Someone came to him appearing to be like a prophet. And, and, and actually, the Bible talks about this guy. I guess he, he was an old prophet, but he lied to him. We won't even get into why, because many people say that was for selfish gain, because he figured that, hey, if you can come here and prophesy over this altar and this altar split in half and the ashes and all that stuff comes out, then maybe, just maybe, you can come back and save Bethel. So some people think he had an ulterior motive, but it doesn't matter. Point is, is that the Bible even says the man was lying to him. So you take an advice from someone who's telling you the Lord told them to tell you something. Just think on that for a moment. And, and, and I'm not putting down any religious people of any kind. I'm just making a point in general. You're taking advice from someone who appears to say that this is what the Lord says. You don't consult with the Lord to see if it's true. So instead of you stand on the path and doing what God has told you to do, you turn it around and doing something else because it sounds good. And that's exactly what this man did. And it cost him his life. Remember when I said, hold on to verse 14. It says that in he rode after the man of God. I meditated on that passage for so long. I thought, wow. This person was on the right track to do what God told him to do. And a lying spirit saddled on a donkey and rode after the man. Marinate on that for just a moment. A lying spirit, meaning this old prophet, got on a donkey and rode after the man. That means that when we're, this is how I think about it in my life. When we're trying to do what's right and we're trying to walk in alignment with what God has told us to do, we have to be aware of the spirit's even in the spiritual realm that tries to come after us to stop us from doing the work of the Lord. This man got on his donkey and rode after that man who was simply minding his own business and trying to get on back home like the Lord told him. Now, let me jump a little bit. I'm going to jump way over bridge and then I'm going to come back. I've been studying this quite a bit, reading some Bible commentaries. And some people believe that these two people in the Bible were unnamed for a reason because they represented um, Judah and um, uh, um, Israel. They represented the, 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 the division, meaning uh, Rehoboam, just follow me a second, Rehoboam, who was only given the tribe of Judah, and these men represented Jeroboam, who was, only, who was given the ten tribes of, um, of Israel. Now, if you know the history with what happened with both uh, tribes, Judah, which is Rehoboam, son of Solomon, so just follow me a second, because this won't, this won't be complicated, but let's just say the one person that was given the one tribe, the tribe of Judah, they were doing right for a little bit and trying. And the Bible even talks about if you go on and read um, 2 Kings um, 17, read 2 Kings 23, um, just just do your own reading. Just just do a little bit more reading. You'll see that at or um, anyway, just read all through 1 Kings and 2 Kings. You'll see that there's references to that. Judah was doing well for a little bit, but then they started being influenced by the other 10 tribes. And they started uh, basically making their own gods and doing their own thing as well. And that's why they all ended up going into exile. 
Both of them did, both sides. And so some people are saying that, hmm, they're not sure if these two men really existed, but this was like a foreshadow of the of the two tribes. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. I even spoke with uh, one of my elders' wives about this yesterday. And so um, I'm careful to say something when, when it's not in the Bible. I'm just making a point that some of the commentaries say that this story goes a lot deeper than it is. It, 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 it teaches us that even when we're trying to do well, don't allow yourself to be influenced by others because that's exactly what happened with, with um, the tribe in Judah and the ten tribes that was given to Jeroboam. Now I'm going to come back off of that bridge. You can look that up later on your own. Whether or not that's true or not, look it up. In either case, it kind of doesn't matter to me. The point is, is that it's in the Bible. This story is in the Bible and there's a lot we can draw from it. So the bottom line is, um, where was I at? That man of God um, ended up being killed because he did not follow the advice and the wisdom that the Lord had given him and unfortunately ended up costing him his life. You can go on down to read more about how um, the prophet that lied to him, how he mourned him and felt bad and basically said, when he die, I want my bones to be buried on his bones. Again, that gets into more of like a selfish gain um, because back then they believed strongly, strongly in the afterlife. And if you read on in the stories, when Josiah came along, all everything was burnt down, and the only grave site that was saved was the one from this prophet, the 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 prophet that the Lord sent. And so, some people believe that the reason why this uh, lying prophet um, wanted to be buried with him uh, because he wanted to make sure that he had a guarantee he'd be in the afterlife. Again, you can read that going down and read verse I don't know twenty six all the way to verse um. I don't know, maybe 33 or something. And you can you can draw your own conclusions from that and speak to your elders and ministers. Again, I'm no one's minister. I'm no one's, you know, um, I don't even know the words to give. I just soak and love my Bible. And I just, it's like candy to me. I love to just eat it up. So I'm just giving you um, 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 what I feel that God has put on my heart after reading through this. But anyway, so I, th- I find it interesting that both um, people in this story was unnamed. Let me see how much further I want to take this. I'm probably going to wrap this up right now. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I want to go into a little bit more. The very bottom line, if you read on in chapter 14, um, Jeroboam, the one who was given the 10 tribes of Israel, right, um, and the one who was just prophesied against, right, uh, his son became ill. He sent his wife to that same prophet that told him you were going to rule and said, hey, save my son. And the shortest version I can give you is the prophet's like, no, God's about to wipe all of this out. And in, in fact, he says, your son is going to be the only one um, that's going to die and be buried because everybody else like, no, we're done. Um, so you can read all chapter 14 on your own. So the premise of this um, let me read verse 9. So chapter 14, verse 9, when, when he was trying to get his son healed, he said, You've done more evil than all who live before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have provoked me to anger and thrust me behind your back. Because of this, I'm going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will bring up the house of Jeroboam as one burns up dung um, until it is all gone and then and he just goes into a lot of description about what's going to happen, how the dogs are going to eat their flesh and this and that. So, you know, the Lord was just like, no, 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 no. I, I, I allowed you to be in this position and you, you still turned around and worship these other gods. I'm going to stop right there because I can just keep going with this. I just love this. When you read through a lot of the Old Testament, especially if you read just through um, First Kings and Second Kings, it almost makes me cry because... There's such a flow in the spirit and in the Bible of, man, God just wants us to just worship and follow him and seek his face. He just wants to rescue us and be there for us. That's all. And then when we get to these places where we feel we've arrived or we've done whatever, it's so consistent throughout the kings in the Bible. And this is just a drop in the ocean of just two or three of them, right? But it's so consistent that you get to a place, you forget what the Lord say, you begin worshiping other gods. This is what many of them did, not all, but many. And then God had to turn around and raise up an adversary, someone to come against them, to humble them, which is what the, um, it talks about in First Kings, I think chapter, maybe chapter 10, chapter 11. It talks about how the Lord set all this up to humble them because they were not doing what they needed to do. They were not, they, they stopped worshiping him. Can you imagine rescuing them and pulling them out of Egypt? And then can you imagine them turning around and building calves and gods, sacrificing their kids and stuff to these gods and saying, this is our Lord, our God. 
And it, it's such a, I really believe, let me just speak for myself. I almost want to say that God has feelings that it hurts him, but I know some people may be a little like, well, Z, that's not quite true. And some people may say, well, no, that is true. But if you read all through the Bible, it talks about how he says, I long to hold you. I long to gather you. You know, if you would just love me, if you would just basically, if you would just remember me. And so many times throughout the Bible, um, if you look at me now, my hand is going up and down like a wave. There's like a wave. There's like a wave. You know, so when 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 we think about our lives and again, let me just speak for myself because I'm not preaching to nobody. I'm just sharing my own life. I am constantly on guard asking him, God, don't you ever in your life give me more than what I can handle. Don't you ever in your life bless me to a point where I forget who you are. It is so important that you stay in your word, stay in prayer. And no matter what you go through in life, and you guys know we all go through things, right? We won't even get into me talking about the death of my son. But it's so important that when we go through our ups and our downs in life, we remember the Lord. We remember what he has said. And when this wisdom and this advice comes to us from different people, remember Rehoboam? When um, he didn't want to take the advice of the elders, he consulted with all of his young friends, all of his friends who, who were with him. And he took their advice because it just sounded good. Remember the, 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 the prophet, the, the, the man of God that came to warn Jeroboam, right? You know, when this man came and said, I'm a prophet, here's what the angel of the Lord said to me. There's nothing in there about consulting with the Lord. Nothing in there about it. Absolutely nothing at all. Throughout all of the people that I just talked about, there's nothing in there about it. And look what happens. Before you know it, you're worshiping golden calves. Now, you may say, well, Z, I don't worship no golden calves. I don't build an idol. Well, times have changed a little bit. So it's not so much worshiping some big gold calf that you built in your backyard. You, you don't really see that nowadays, at least not. I've not seen it, right? But it's, the, it's more so the idols we cherish in our hearts, doing what we want to do instead of what the Lord tells us to do. Worshiping or maybe putting a relationship before God. That's an idol. Worshipping money because it's more important to make money and to have, you know, all of this money in your account and to work yourself to death trying to make money instead of spending some time with the Lord. You know, it could be worshiping yourself, your body. You care more about your, 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 your looks, your house, your this, your that. You get what I'm saying? It could be pride. So, so the idol still exists. It's just in a different form. And it's just so important that we remember the Lord. That's the whole premise of this. I was not planning on speaking for 32 minutes. But when, when I read that one passage in verse 14, when it says that that man saddled his donkey and rode after him, that just that struck me like a chord, you guys. It struck me like a chord that, my God, we got to be careful. Even when we are trying to do what's right before the Lord, a lying evil spirit can be riding, trying to come after you and deceive you. Not every advice you get, baby, is good advice. Even if it appears to be coming from a prophet or a man of God or someone saying an angel told me this, or if it's your best friends or the people you feel you trust the most, consult with the Lord and always get your wisdom and guidance from him. And yes, it is important that we seek counsel. The book of Psalms screams that, that, you know, um, a wise man seeks counsel, wise man seeks, seeks advice. But even in that, you got to be wise with who you're getting it from. And you got to be able to go back to God and say, God, is this from you? You guys have no idea the amount of advice, advice and input I get almost on a daily per, uh, basis, not only from my um, um, subscribers, my staff, family and friends. I have so many people trying to throw advice to me, and I've made a lot of people mad by either not taking the advice or saying, I got to wait to see if this is what God wants me to do. I really do. One day I'm going to tell you guys the story, and it'll be one day soon. So you'll know what's going on behind the scenes and you'll understand all of the things that I could have done uh, to I want I don't want to get into all of this now, but all of the things that I could have done to have in some way or another made money from what I'm doing now with this podcast. And there's nothing wrong with making an income. There's nothing wrong with that. I believe God wants us to be prosperous. Let me get that straight. But every single time I went against what I know what God has told me to do. And God has made it clear to me, you're going to pour into people. Now, it's been three years now, this podcast, believe it or not. You're going to pour and pour and pour and give and open your heart up and share it all. And the only thing you're going to be presenting to them, or at least the first thing uh, God's put in my heart, is your book. Because I'm writing this book through you. And if you guys knew the amount of, I don't want to say arguments, the amount of conversations that I've had with people who've tried to convince me to do this, do that. Well, you need to at least do this. We need to make money from this. You need to da-da-da. And I'm like, absolutely not. I will go broken into the grave obeying the Lord 
before I do anything that comes against the advice and what he's told me to do. And I don't care. I don't care what financial expert or someone comes in and says something. I don't care because I know the sound of the, of the voice of the Lord. And when you're following and walking in his steps, the Bible says that he's never seen the righteous children beg, beg for uh, food. He's always taking care of us. And some way or another, he, he provides. So anyway, I love you all. I love you. I love you. It's so, so, so important. I can't even explain it, but it's so important uh, that you walk in step with the spirit, that you obey the voice of the Lord and that you seek advice. And I pray if this message helps just one person, because the enemy has come against me so many times to keep from getting this out. It's not even funny. And I don't know why, but there has to be someone out there that needs to hear this. So I pray that whoever is on the verge of making some decisions because of some wisdom or advice someone's given to them, that they first go to their knees in prayer and search out God's answer. And if you say, but God ain't speaking, ain't heard nothing, baby, I highly advise you to wait until the Lord speaks to you. Because I've made decisions where I thought, well, I ain't heard nothing from him. Let me just make my own decision and keep going. And every single time I've had to backstep from that position. And it was not the right decision to make. So please, please, please seek counsel from the Lord. I pray you guys have been encouraged by this. This is Z with Unlocking Greatness Podcast. Love you all. And I'm looking forward to making the announcement of my book this week. Oh, my God, I've been preparing for spiritual battle like you would not believe because this is definitely a war against the enemy. And um, when I tell you that this has taken everything out of me every in, in every fashion form to be able to release um, this book that God has been working on me for years. Oh, my God, if you guys only knew the amount of tears and the amount of effort um, that's gone into this. But I know that I'm honoring God and what I'm doing. So anyway, let me go. I better stop talking. Love you all. Uh, this is Z with Unlocking Greatness Podcast. Bye bye.